Hello and welcome to the NBA Outlet presented by OTGBasketball.com. Make sure you follow OTG on Twitter at OTG Basketball. I'm your host, Nick Fay. With me as always, Corey Waldron. Special guest today, founding father of the NBA Outlet, Parth Garadia. What's up, fellas? What's up, Nick? I'm glad to be on with your original co-host, uh, Parth. You know, long time no speak, but uh, it's good to have you on, man. Founding father. I, I appreciate that. I would, I would say, though, Harris is one of the, is, is the original founding father. Of the OTG pod. Maybe the outlet, maybe it's you and I, Nick, but got to give Harris a shout out. For sure. Harris was on last week for episode 100. Check that out if you haven't done that yet. Also, shout out to Parth, big part of what OTG was doing in the beginning. So, a lot of love for him, but a lot of great topics to talk about today. First on the list, we're going to talk about LeBron getting 30,000 points, youngest to do that. What are your thoughts on that and LeBron as a player, his accomplishments, and everything? I mean, uh, it was a little corny the Instagram post to the younger <laughs> self. I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm a fan of these things. You know, I know Kobe talked to his younger self and his, like, dear basketball thing a little bit. Wade did it in the past uh, when he was at the Bulls. You know, like, you're going to have to learn adversity and stuff like that. It's a little corny, but at the same time, it's, like, just something NBA players do. Uh, but congratulating himself is a little bit corny. But, you know, 30,000, youngest player ever to do it. Um, unfortunately, it came as in another loss for the Cavaliers. Um, and as Wade said in the Instagram post after, in the dark time, this was a light. <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of, besides the drama, you know, LeBron James continues to add on to his resume of why he's, you know, a top three greatest of all time player in this league. Yeah, I also thought the Instagram post was a little corny. One of my favorite hip hop lyrics is Real G's moving silence like lasagna <laughs> from Lil Wayne. I don't know what song it was. It was back when... Like, I know the line. It's a classic. Yeah, but these NBA players do not move in silence at all. <laughs> like they are very, a lot of them are very showy, and I get why you want to up your marketability that way. Different type of endorsements, whether you endorse something uh, through Instagram, through a post, or a national TV kind of ad or spot. So I don't, I don't blame them all at all for kind of being showy, being a little corny, trying to be inspirational. But yeah, the thirty thousand is incredible. He's the youngest to ever do it. I think he'll continue to be the youngest to ever do it. I don't think Katie will get there just because he's missed time. He's basically missed a full season, and he also went to college for a year, so he's kind of two seasons behind in that aspect. So I think LeBron will stay as the youngest to do it, and it's it's an incredible accomplishment, man. Uh, shout out to him. You, when you think of LeBron, you think of someone that's more like a Magic Johnson, a pass first kind of get your play, get your teammates involved kind of guy, but my man can score the ball. Yeah, that's what LeBron said in his, uh, like, after the game. You know, he was so, it was crazy that he did that. And, you know, going to the league, he was like a pass-first guy, and he just ended up getting the scoring. What would you say is your favorite LeBron moment, you know, so far in his career? Mm. All right, well, two stick out in, in mind. Uh, the first one, is, which is funny to me, it's the game-winning three against the Orlando Magic in the um, yeah. what the first or second round. That was like one of the first times I like actually watched LeBron in a playoff game, um, and you know he hit that buzzer beater. And then the second would be the probably the most memorable moment in LeBron's career. Uh, probably one of the biggest plays of his career is the block on Iggy. I just think that's you know kind of career-defining that block. I mean that's what LeBron James is known for. So I I feel like I'm a little bit older than you, Corey. So I remember a little bit more of earlier LeBron I just hated LeBron it's not that I, I just wasn't a fan all right so I'm not gonna age myself right now I'll say we're the same age uh, but <laughs> I, I've seen I've watched a lot of LeBron especially in high middle school high school uh when I was really impressionable at that time I really watched a lot of NBA basketball as just a, as a pure fan so I remember a lot of LeBron moments the first one that really sticks out to me was I believe he had like 25 of 27 against that monstrous Detroit team with Chauncey, yep. Rip Hamilton, Sheed, Ben Wallace, Tayshad, where he basically got them to the finals. I think that was in uh, 2000, 2007, I believe. Mm -hmm. That moment sticks out. Uh, I don't remember the, the game winner against the Magic as well. Or I mean, I, I saw it happen live. Me and my dad were watching. But it doesn't really stick out as like a major moment um, in his career to me. Uh, I would say the decision is another big moment for me. I was yeah. a Heat fan, a big Dwayne Wade guy. Uh, not so much anymore because he's flashes and not flash. I guess love <laughs> is fickle. But no, that was good. 
uh, the, the the decision, of course, his face in Game Six of 2012 with the uh, the Miami Red alternate jersey. He still had the headband, still had like the the thick. It wasn't a full beard, but it was like a goatee kind of thing going on. Uh, just his face and his demeanor that entire game uh, in Boston, where he basically ended the Celtics' big three. Uh, that was a big moment for me. The of course him winning in the finals. The uh, I believe it was against OKC 2012, where he fall, he misses a layup, falls down, has cramps, and then uh, the shot clock's running down, and I believe he shoots a three. It was probably over Thabo Cephalosha or KD, but he shoots a three from the top of the key, and he hobbles back on defense, uh, makes the three, hobbles back on defense, and they call a timeout. Uh, so that's that's another big moment. Him ducking on Jason Terry, oh, another yes. big moment. The uh, can't forget that. The Wade to uh, to Mario Chalmers to Norris Cole up to LeBron and just bangs on Jason Terry off the alley oop in Boston is another big moment. And of course, me not I'm not a Cleveland fan or a, really a LeBron fan, but the the block at Iguodala is probably his defining moment of his career because it happened in Cleveland, got them their first championship after his coming back story. I think that will be his. Now, I don't want to say one shining moment because that's like a college thing, but his one moment that will stick out above the rest of um, um, a ton of moments that will forever be remembered. Yeah, honestly, that block, you could see that being um, pretty much his highlight that leads off his Hall of Fame reel. But I'm agreeing. I think LeBron and that LeBron Iggy block and then Parth, like you said, he scored 25 straight against the Pistons in that game. So... Like, being able to do that against a Detroit Pistons team at that time that was so good defensively was so impressive, and it kind of just, like, sucked you into that LeBron hype. Like, when he did that, it was just like, all right, you know, we know this guy's going to be destroying everybody. But moving on from there, shout-out to LeBron. Congratulations. Quick reminder, you can listen to NBA Outlet on iTunes, Block Talk Radio, otgbasketball.com. But for some juicy drama, Jason Kidd was fired earlier this week. It's kind of been a known thing by Bucks fans, NBA fans. You know, we thought it was going to happen earlier this month, and it did happen. Kid was underachieving, didn't have good relationships with players, staff, front office members, and he just always had an excuse that the team was young. So what are your thoughts on Jason Kidd being fired? Well, Nick, I know this really hurts you and pains you oh, because I know you're so a bad. huge Jason Kidd lover. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, it is funny how his, I know players didn't like him. I know that uh, Sean Kilpatrick tweeted – LOL, thank God, after he was fired. <laughs> um, and he was only there for a short time, which is already funny that you know, his relationship is already so poor with Jason Kidd. Um, obviously, we know Ante DeCumpo wasn't so happy about the firing. Uh, he tried to – he told Jason Kidd he was going to reach out to ownership and try and make them change their minds. Obviously, that didn't happen. But like you said, just in your little summary, Nick, the Bucks underachieved. You know, this is a Bucks team that at least you and me predicted to be a top five seed in the East, to be really dominating. They even added Eric Bledsoe, and they haven't gotten better. If anything, they've gotten worse. Um, there's a lot of good players on this team that just haven't really gelled. Obviously, Jabari Parker is on his way back, but uh, the team should be a lot higher up in the East uh, than the eighth to or the seventh to ninth seed range that they're at currently. So I thought it was a little bit surprising. Uh, I don't watch as much NBA basketball as I used to. I, I've shifted a little bit more towards college, which is surprising. No, it'd be, but. It, it, it kind of took me aback a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of surprised they they didn't wait until Jabari came back to see what the team looks like. I'm surprised they made it mid-season uh, versus at the end of the season after everything shook out. Uh, so I don't know, man. I'm, like, I'm not surprised that a relationship, him having poor relationships led to this. Because even in, when he was in Brooklyn, like the way he left Brooklyn was kind of just weird. It was bad. Yeah, it was. I mean, a lot of the, it left a sour taste in a lot of Nets fans, you know, eyes because of what he did for the franchise as a player. But the, what he did as a coach, you know, trying to get that power hungry thing, it wasn't a good look. And like those relationships matter, uh, especially at a business as uh, close knit as the basketball industry is, especially at the pro level. Everyone knows everyone. Yep. Everyone has a relationship with everyone for the most part. It's very rare that you don't know someone at a high level executive or high level coach or at, at up at that level they all know each other so you know one sour relationship could lead to multiple different uh relationships that eventually will sour and i think the way he left brooklyn uh not only just for fans but 
just executives and people around the league like that that stuff's not that stuff's not cool and then when you don't produce as a coach to your expectations like it, it you have that grace period is really short so in that aspect I'm not surprised but I don't know if I was in, if I was in charge I would have at least let him run the course through the season and then figure out what to do I'm not a big fan of mid-season coaching changes I think one of the main reasons they <clears throat> wanted to do it now is they felt like the team wasn't getting better and they wanted to kind of capitalize on this season. They're thinking maybe some changes can change that because not only are they underachieving, but there's been a lot of talk about bad rotations, lack of adjustments. Obviously, Giannis started the season being so dominant and he's cooled down. Obviously, teams are adjusting and the Bucks haven't really adjusted. And like Corey mentioned, they got Eric Bledsoe and it really didn't make much of a difference. They've kind of stayed at the same level. So really interesting stuff and Parth you made a great point with the sour relationship you know now he has two places because in the Bucks organization it wasn't just you know the players it was the front office people as well so I think it could be tough for him to find a job at some point I think Doc Rivers said he would take him on his staff but kid comes off to me as a really egotistical guy when it comes to coaching yeah it's funny you say that too because I know at least from you know just being on Twitter that there's a lot of uh People like the Grizzlies obviously need a head coach, and I know like the Grizzly fan base is begging not to hire Jason Kidd. Like a lot of people don't even want Jason Kidd as a head coach, whether you know it's because of the ego, like you mentioned, which is clear and evident if you watch him on the sidelines or even give a you know a press conference. Um, I, I agree that it's gonna be tough for him to f find a job, and also the Bucks fired all of his assistant coaches who were like really close with him, so the Bucks want nothing to do with Jason Kidd. Yeah, so definitely interesting stuff. He went 139 and 152 with the Bucks. Obviously, he it, it started off better than it ended because, you know, when he came to the Bucks, they kind of surprised everybody and made the playoffs. And then after that, and they were a really good defensive team. And ever since then, they haven't hit that defensive level. So I think that was a big reason why they let him go. What do you think is going to happen for the Bucks the rest of the year? Are they going to get better, stay the same, or get a little worse? I'm going to say they're going to get better, but that's not – it has nothing to do with coaching. I think that's simply them getting Jabari Parker back. Um, I know that also Jason Kidd kind of didn't use Brogdon at times. I remember seeing a clip where uh, it was like the second or almost the end of the second quarter, and Brogdon hadn't even logged a minute. And Anthony Kumpo was like, why aren't you in yet? And Brogdon's like, I got no idea. And it's just like things like that which like, just don't make sense to logical like basketball minds. Um, I think rotations might be a little bit better, but I think Jabari Parker is going to have the biggest impact to make maybe push this team a little bit farther ahead. Yeah, I – you know what, now that I think about it a little bit more, uh, this season is is critical because the Cavs look so, I don't know, like mediocre. Like they don't look Wonderful. like, yeah, they don't look like the Cavs of old. And the East looks like they could be had. I don't think Boston is really that good. Uh, they, what are they, number one in the East right now? Yep. I think four game right. losing streak right now at the moment. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Boston is that good. Offensively, Brad Stevens is such a good coach, but I don't think he has has given him the offensive pieces just yet. It hurts with Gordon Hayward not being there, but yep. to be top three for them to really win, um, I don't know if they could keep that up. It's it's tough. Defensive, de play defense is like a want-to kind of thing, and you have to have energy for it, and that's just tough to sustain over 82 games uh, without just having an off, uh, off diet where you could just shoot the lights out. It, and Boston doesn't really do that. Toronto looks good, but I mean the East is open, so I would hope that the Bucks would want to chase Eastern Conference Championship crown this season because it looks like it could be had by a couple of different teams. Of course, I would still pick Cleveland as the favorite because LeBron, but like you said, they're vulnerable. So hopefully, with Parker coming back, it changes things. And like Corey said, they they make a nice little run. Yeah, and uh, like you mentioned, we'll mention the Cavs are vulnerable. We're going to talk about them next. Obviously, there's been drama in Cleveland. Feels like every other week. Three and seven in the last ten. They had an emotional team meeting this week, calling out Kevin Love for leaving Saturday's game, faking his illness, saying he's missing practice and he doesn't really want to be there. Obviously, there's uh, Isaiah Thomas, uh, quote unquote, was the one leading that meeting against Kevin Love. Also, Isaiah Thomas has mentioned the team doesn't practice or try that hard like they did in Boston. They're only three and a half games ahead of the eight seed. So what are your thoughts on all the drama in Cleveland right now? I kind of find it really, I don't know, is it ironic or funny that a guy who's played eight games all year is calling out a guy who's been on the team for three years or four years, whatever it is now, with Kevin Love? 
Uh, Isaiah Thomas shouldn't call anyone out at this point in time. I, I don't know where he kind of gets off. I, mean, I might be a little bit aggressive right now, but I, it bothered me when I found out that he was the one who initiated it because he really doesn't have a place to call it anybody. And he also made the, you know, the mention the guys aren't practicing, which I feel like is a shot at Wade. Yeah. Last year in Chicago, guys were like, Wade doesn't practice every day. And, you know, Kobe didn't practice every day either his, his like, you know, near the end of his career. The older guys just can't do it, especially Wade, who has bad knees. I'm sure it's very hard to practice every single day or, or give 100% every day. It's just how it is at the age of 36 now. Um, obviously, I feel like any time a LeBron James team struggles, there is drama. It doesn't matter if he's in Miami, the first stint with Cleveland or now. There just seems to always be a cloud that follows. And, you know, I guess you could say LeBron's kind of a drama queen because it seems to always come around LeBron. Um, you know, Kevin Love isn't the issue. If I was Kevin Love, I'd actually probably demand a trade at this point. Um, it looks like Kyrie Irving got out, like, just in time, as if he knew the shitstorm was coming, and he was like, I just got to jump ship. Um, but the Cavs are in a bad place, man. It's crazy to see the narrative turn so quick about mm-hmm. Isaiah Thomas. Like, just in the playoffs last year, oh, he's giving it everything he has. He's fighting through uh, the tragedy well, of losing his sister. Well, no, 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 no. He, he did. No, no, no. I don't want to take anything away from Isaiah Thomas. I don't want, I don't want that to be the message I was given. Because he clearly, I mean, everything he did for Boston was over the top, and he went above and beyond what a player needs to do, especially after his sister passed. But, you know, in the short state of Cleveland where you, you just started playing, I just don't think a guy like him who just got on the court should be calling out other guys on faking an illness. No, I, I understand what you're saying, and I'm not coming at you or anything for trying to change the narrative, but just like the, the overall narrative in general, not just what you're saying, but it, it's changed about him. Like, you're not the only person that feels like, dude, why is, right, this, right. why is this guy the one calling people out? He's barely been here. But what I'm saying is, Last year, Isaiah Thomas was looked upon as this the savior for Boston. He's the best thing Boston has going. He's given Boston everything. And now this year, it's uh, what's he doing at Cleveland? He's a ball stopper. He he doesn't really work in the flow of an offense, especially with offensive talent like Cleveland has. And then the whole Pierce and IT video tribute retirement jersey thing like it's just been a bad end to 2017 and start to 2018 for Isaiah Thomas in terms of just like public perception of him. Honestly, it's been really rough and and Brad Stevens probably helped him out so much defensively with his scheme that I have a good feeling that Isaiah Thomas is going to lose a lot of money this summer because I don't see anybody willing to give him the max like they might have given him a summer ago just because he's such a liability defensively. Yeah, he can still put up buckets, but if you don't have a Brad Stevens type of defensive system behind him, you're just going to get abused. And it's not like he's putting up efficient numbers. And and I'm not throwing shade. We never know if he'll actually be the same coming back from a hip injury, which is pretty serious. So like Corey said, I don't like that. And also I've seen this on Twitter. Like why are people giving Kevin Love a hard time when Derrick Rose doesn't even know if he wants to play basketball? If you're Love, are you demanding a trade? I mean, I don't know if I demand a trade. I, I don't think Kevin Love really has a problem. But, you know, I just think there's a point in time where, like, if your team's ragging on you and you're always a scapegoat. I mean, we saw Chris Bosh have to deal with it all four years in Miami. You know, whenever Miami struggled, it was, oh, Chris Bosh, you're not doing enough. And Kevin and Chris Bosh even told Kevin Love, that's probably what's going to happen to you because you're the third wheel in Cleveland. And even after Kyrie has left and Kevin Love has kind of become the, the number two guy, he still gets treated as, like, the scapegoat. And I just think Kevin Love, who's, you know, you, you can kind of see the writing on the wall that Cleveland's window title chasing is over, uh, especially with this roster. I think it wouldn't be dumb for Kevin Love to say, get out of here, you know, get what you can for me, but I'm done. Yeah, if I, if I was Kevin Love, I don't know. I, I don't think I would ask for a trade because you're still the favorite in the East to make the finals, at least in my opinion. But, man, the Warriors are going to sweep you guys if you like <laughs> If if you if the roster stays the same, I know there are reports of trying to trade for George Hill, which would help uh, the backcourt defensively. Does Iman Shumpert even play anymore? He does, but he's he just I think he just came back and he's yeah. not very good. He's, okay. he's, he he can't shoot. He's never gotten over the first knee injury in New York. Pretty much. Okay, so I mean, he would he would George Hill would be a defensive upgrade, but George Hill is also hurt all the time. So, I mean, it's not putting you over the top to where you could contend with the Warriors unless you make another trade. 
uh, if if you do indeed get George Hill. But if I was Kevin Love, I don't I don't think I'd ask for a trade. I'd probably stick it out at least this season, and then based on what LeBron does next season, make your move then. Yeah, I think I mean, it's tough. That- Go ahead, Corey. No, no, go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say, you know, if Kevin Love sticks it out, then he might as well just stay because then he'll be the face of the franchise when LeBron leaves, right? I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you'd want to win, but if LeBron leaves and Kevin Love becomes the number one option on this roster, just something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, if you're the Cavs and LeBron leaves, you probably try to move Love and flip him for assets. But I think um, if the Cavs are going to do anything this year, they need to make a blockbuster type move. It won't be one move. It has to be like, a roster changing move where they're adding a lot more athleticism, defensive talent, and just guys that fit with LeBron that <clears throat> aren't over the age of 32. You know, they need some younger dudes, or if not, it's just going to be a sweep. And like we mentioned, there's no guarantee they're going to the finals. So if you had to put a percentage on, I know I asked this a lot on the pod, but I feel like every week it gets a little bit, the Cavs get a little bit more vulnerable. What would be your percentage on the Cavs making the finals this year? Um, I actually think it's, it's probably right right around 50% now, right? It's got to be 50-50 because I know everyone alludes to there's a switch. There's clearly no switch. I'm, can we put that to rest that LeBron's team don't really have a switch? Because I can't see this roster getting into the playoffs and going, all right, guys, playoff time. Let's just all play superstar basketball. I, I just can't see that being a, a possible route for this team. So I'm going to say 50% because there's, you know, the Raptors have looked really good. The Celtics have stumbled uh, offensively, but defensively they're still the best team, I think. And then, you know, there's still a couple teams like Miami's playing really well. I don't think, you know, I think it's 50%. You know, I think it's, I think it's higher than that. But I think seeding actually really matters in the East this year because you do not want to be the, the second or third seed in the East this year. You want to be the first because after the first, after the top three teams, there's a clear drop off. I think Miami's number four. I wouldn't, like, I don't know. Miami doesn't really have any all stars. I wouldn't be afraid to play Miami in the playoffs like they always play hard but i i wouldn't be i would rather want miami than uh possibly a washington uh or toronto definitely toronto or or boston i know i think washington is fifth right now yeah and they're 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 all over the place uh so i i i would avoid boston and toronto which i if cleveland gets the one seed Obviously, Boston will be two or three. Toronto will be two or three. I don't think you want to go through those two teams. Like, you wouldn't want to play Toronto in the second round and Boston in the Eastern Conference Finals. I think that makes your road 10 times tougher, especially this year for Cleveland. Exactly. I agree with that. And I think uh, getting that first seed is going to be very difficult because I believe they're six games back of the first seed right now. And Boston just seems more interested in winning regular season games than Cleveland does. So I don't know what the Cavs are going to do. Obviously, we'll be talking about that a lot. But... Moving on to our last segment, if you guys didn't catch uh, episode 100, we did an all-star draft for the starters, but today uh, Parth is going to fill in for Jay as Steph Curry. Uh, Corey's going to take over as LeBron as he was last week, and we're going to finish this draft. So LeBron's team was Giannis Antetokounmpo, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, Joel Embiid. Curry's team was James Harden, DeMar DeRozan, Anthony Davis, and DeMarcus Cousins. So without further ado, do you want to make your first pick? So I think I get the first pick now that it's the reserves because... LeBron got the first pick in the the starters draft. Is that correct? Correct. Well, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not, can, we're making. I'm allowed. Right. Right. It not is now. Pick anyone from e- either conference, right? Yep. Oh, that's tough. There are a lot of good names. I'm happy. I'm happy. Dave finally made the All Star team again. He's very deserving. Uh, I'm surprised Chris Paul did make. It. I know he missed a lot of games, but I'm still surprised he didn't make it. Yeah, especially well, George the- didn't make it either. Especially with the Rockets record, I think that was interesting because usually, you know, you play that hard, you have the second best record in the league, you're getting two All Stars. Yeah, and uh, you know, the Wizards got two at Bradley Beal and John Wall, and they're Yikes. kind of falling off the rails right now. So, uh, but I would probably go with, you know, I take it AD and I take it Cousins. Uh, there are a lot of good guards, but they're they're less good bigs. So I would go with someone like a. You know what? I'll, I'll I'll keep it in the Warriors family. I'll go with Draymond. All right. You know, I, I like it. Obviously, you're you're staying safe. You're staying with what you know. Um, I'm gonna get someone who I know hates you guys. So Russell Westbrook. <laughs> yes. 
And I'm going to make him and Katie play again with each other again, just because last <laughs> year when they threw that oop to each other, like the Twitter and the universe almost ended, which was really enjoyable. You know what? I think if this was the actual draft, the NBA would not allow KD and Russell to be on the same team. <laughs> I think it's so much more exciting when they're on opposite teams. But I don't know. Like, I, like what would you do for a, a Russ fast break where KD tries to block his dunk? Like, that would be the moment of the All-Star game. Especially if it gets really aggressive, too. And, like, KD fouls him hard and it's the All-Star game. It'll be like, oh, my God. And then they just start getting up and then, you know, what will happen next. Fake NBA fights. I know, right? There's been a lot of NBA fights this this uh, this season. Surprisingly, I don't know what's going on. Like, fight season, <laughs> fights between players, fights between refs and players. Like this has been, people are PMSing hardcore this season. Anarchy, for sure. Anarchy. <laughs> so you took Westbrook. I'll go with. I'll stay big, and I'll go with. Uh, uh, should I take Porzingis or Cat? We'll go with. Uh, uh, We'll go with Big Cat for me. Ooh, that was – I kind of wanted Cat, but I'm, I'm going to go, uh, surprisingly, with LaMarcus Aldridge because wow. I want to talk to him about the Spurs because I have interest in possibly going to San Antonio this offseason. So I'm just going to talk oh. to them and see what's going on. Okay, I see you, Corey. Oh, I, my bad. See you, LeBron. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, 30K oh. club against the Spurs, just interested in the culture. <laughs> All right, so I've I've taken I have four bigs now. I th- I think my bigs are great. I have Cat, Draymond, Cousins, and Anthony Davis. While your only bigs are Embiid and Lamarcus, I guess you can count eight. Uh, Kevin Durant as a as a big since he is seven foot. We don't uh, care about bigs I, in this league, man. Come on. <laughs> I know, I know, but <laughs> I'm still a believer. It's skilled bigs beats uh little skilled. So I would go. I I need a guard. Left, I have to go with I have to go with Clay since he's a teammate. Keeping the Warriors culture together, I, <laughs> I like it. I might as well just trade. I might as well trade you Durant at this point, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Give me KD. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my next pick is obviously my issue is Bigs, um, and I I want Kevin Love to feel safe. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna pick Kevin Love because I just wanted to know that I still somewhat love him because he does little things for my team. Okay, LeBron, trying to keep your team happy. You know, I got I to I gotta play Peacemaker. You know, him and Isaiah Thomas are beefing. Three ball handlers. Let's see. Maybe maybe four ball handlers left. I'm going to take another. How many do I have? I have eight players. So there's four more players left. I'll go with, uh, I'll go with the unicorn, Chris Stapps. Not a good pick. Not a good pick? I, no, I said good pick. Oh, okay. He was upset for one second. He was like, "Shit!" He's like, "Damn, I thought that was yeah, a good." Dude, one. I mean, you 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 guys are uh, closer to New York than I am. Have you heard something about Chris Stapps? That I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, we haven't picked a lot of people from the East yet. We're we're killing these Western reserves. Um, this is just because this this is uh, Corey called me, so I'm gonna pick Victor Oladipo only <laughs> because uh, Vic the Quick is is a goat, and I want to see him and Westbrook play together again. Oladipo's having a fantastic year. Incredible, yeah. So much about the yeah, NBA kind of where you are is just fit and your role. And his fit with Westbrook wasn't great. And his fit with the Pacers and his new role as kind of the go-to guy. He's been playing very, very well. Shout out to him. I'm happy he made the All-Star team. He deserved it. Yeah, for sure. Honestly, and it came at, like, not out of nowhere, but, like, we didn't expect Oladipo to make this type of jump. We thought his numbers pick up in Indiana, but to get to this level so quick is definitely a a big jump for him. All right, so my team, we need some guards. I need a ball handler. I'll go with, uh, I'll I'll go with John Wall, because I feel like he's he's perfect for an all-star type of game. Uh, Just will look for people constantly. And we'll push the pace. So I'll, I'll go with John Wall, even though he's kind of having a down season. Yeah, he doesn't look healthy. Uh, man, oh, man. Okay. Yeah, no, he he has not looked as good as he definitely has in the recent past. But I think is a part of the Wizards' struggles, you know, for them saying that they're contenders and the best team in the league. <clears throat> they really should have put some more uh, – some thought into how they play. Okay. Uh, my next pick. Oh man, 
uh, I'm on the fence between. Yeah, I'm gonna take Jimmy Butler. Solid pick right? there. Right, Jimmy Butler's there. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy Butler's still there. I'm taking JB. Uh, I have a lot of defenders on my team because LeBron said that they're gonna actually play hard. Or I mean, I said that we're gonna play hard in this All Star game. That we want people to actually watch the game and enjoy it and show them some good competitive nature. So I'm just gonna go with another defender just to you know lock up your warrior lineup. I'm gonna take. Uh... Damian Lillard. <clears throat> I was hoping he was going to slip one more pick. <laughs> all right, so everyone in the West is taken. I think all we have left is uh, Lowry, Beal, and Horford. Correct. And I can already see who's just like dangling that no one wants. I'm not <laughs> going to say his name because I know he's going to get picked last. I, I think probably. I know who you're talking about too. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to go with Bradley Beal. I want another shooter on my team. Uh, you know, flea gunner. There we go. <laughs> so I know. I think I know who you're going to take. I'm taking Lowry. Yeah, yeah, that's that was predictable. So now you got Lowry and DeRozan, and of course, I'm gonna have to get the guy who's gonna set screens, uh, picks, moving uh, gonna, picks. Mo- yeah, moving picks. He's gonna hit a, some beautiful, nice 17 foot jumpers. Um, Al Horford, who I love, but he's just not all star flashy. But then again, we're going to win, so throw some layups Horford's in there the for you. Of, yeah, Horford's the kind of guy I want when we're gonna win because he he can play and make stuff. So my team is now complete. All right. So this is the full lineup we got for both teams. LeBron's got Giannis Antetokounmpo, Kyrie Irving, KD, Embiid, Westbrook, LaMarcus Aldridge, Kevin Love, Victor Oladipo, Jimmy Butler, Bradley Beal, Al Horford. Steph Curry's got James Harden, DeMar DeRozan, Anthony Davis, Cousins, Green, Carl Anthony Towns, Clay Thompson, Kristaps Porzingis, John Wall, Damian Lillard, Kyle Lowry. I like my, I like my squad. I do like my squad. I thought it would be very difficult to beat LeBron because LeBron, KD, and Giannis, that's just an incredible trio of wings. And wings kind of win in this league. It's not the point guard. It's not the big. It it is the wing. But I feel like to kind of balance that out, Anthony Davis could take one of them. Draymond Green can take one of them. And then kind of that that third one is going to be tough. But we got two guys. You definitely got height. I, I went for a, a little bit of length. A lot of my guys, I like length. I like speed. So I got a good mixture of that. But I got to admit, you, know, you got you got a lot of big-time guys. With the Obviously, you have the three-headed dragon before Kevin Durant came. And then you got Anthony Davis and Marcus Cousins. A lot of chemistry. I could be Actually, that would be a pretty fun starting five. I can't really run that. but This would be an awesome lineup to see him throw out there if you ran with Steph Curry's team. Draymond Green, Anthony Davis, DeMarcus Cousins, Carl Anthony Towns, and Kristaps Porzingis. Yeah. <laughs> Just all all fives that can really do everything, or fours, whatever you want to call them. But that would be I, pretty cool. You know, have you guys heard why they're not televising or making the draft public? Don't want to hurt uh, people's feelings. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, that's, like, so, that's so bogus. Yeah. So, I mean – I'm not really surprised. They at least should have done the all-star starters be drafted. Maybe not the reserves and let them do the behind the doors, but the starters are still the starters. Like, who's going to be mad? Oh, my God, you're the 10th starter. Like, bro, you're still starting the all-star game. So, um, who would know. have been the, Who would have been the last starter picked? Uh, who was the last starter? It was DeMar DeRozan. For That's when who we I did it. Uh, would, would have been p- picked last, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's definitely no offense to DeMar, who's having a great season, but he just doesn't have the same flash or hype the other teams. Some of it's his game, some of it's playing in Toronto. You know what? But, I was in, I was actually in Toronto and Mississauga a couple weekends ago for the G League showcase. It was awesome. The the guys up, like the the staff up there that ran it, was great. But man, like it's being in the states versus being in. Uh, being in Canada, just like the coverage you get of the Raptors is on, it's the difference is unreal. Like everything there is Raptors, Raptors, Raptors. Uh, like their their sports center leads with either a Maple Leafs highlight or a Raptors highlight. And here you don't, you might not even get a Raptors highlight <laughs> if you watch sports center yeah. the entire time. So it just like I know there's only one team in Canada, and I was in that same kind of area where they play. Uh, but man, like the coverage that. Like the U.S. fans do not get of Toronto, it's it's kind of sad. Yeah, it's crazy too, and their fan base is strong, so that helps them come playoff time. But anybody stick out to you when you're at the G League uh, showcase? Uh, Emil Jefferson was uh, was really good. He has good numbers. Uh, just a really active big. 
I'm surprised he's not. I know he was one of the last cuts for the the Timberwolves, I believe, uh, and then they they signed him to the Iowa Wolves. But he was really good. It's I don't know what the hell happened to Cliff Alexander. I think he was like the number one player coming out of high school, Kansas, and then right, out of, yeah, he played at Kansas, Kansas, right? Yeah, it didn't I don't know. He didn't click exactly to start, and then I think he had some sort of off the off the field and off, not off the field off the court NCAA eligibility issue, and then dropped in the draft, and now it's just been like he. When I went to Chicago for the. Uh, D League Elite Mini in May too. That was a couple of days before the actual NBA Combine, and he was there too. I was surprised to see him. I'm like, man, why? Well, I, I thought this guy would be in the NBA. Like he's a super super skilled, but he's just like a big physical presence. So I'm surprised he's not he not, he's not in the league. Yeah, he played a little bit with the Net Summer League team, I think, way back when he came out, and like he showed some flashes. Then I think he had some decent moments in like the G League. And then, like you said, it's just kind of been inconsistency. His hands sometimes, like at least when I watched him play, were kind of questionable. He would drop a lot of passes. Like you said, though, he has that physical presence. Yeah, he's probably not the most skilled dude, but, you know, just, I mean, it's it's crazy just to think that he was the number one player in high school at, yeah. at one point. And that wasn't too long ago. And he's now, he's now in the G League, which is not a bad spot, but I just thought he would be in the NBA at this point. But who knows, man? It's tough. You got to be the best of the best, the career with the crop to play yeah, the NBA. Yeah, for sure. Before we get out of here, Parth, what, would you say, like, obviously you follow the G League a good amount or, you know, you pay attention to it. Do you say the fandom of it is growing in terms of actual people paying attention to the games and the players on the team a little bit more than they were before? You know what? It's It, it definitely is growing. Last weekend, I actually wasn't able to come on the 100th, 100th episode because I was in Greensboro for a swarm game. Uh, and their their arena's amazing, and uh, I mean it's it's a small it's a smaller arena, but it gives you like a real kind of college feel to it because it's in Greensboro. Yep. Uh, and so the night I went, it was like Boy Scout night, and so the arena was packed. There were a ton of Boy Scouts there, just a lot of different fans. I had basically like a courtside seat, which was awesome. Uh, the Swarm aren't the best. <laughs> they're not the best team in the G League, but they're continuing to get better. They played 905, uh, the Raptors team, and they had Lorenzo Brown, who was great. He's, I think, a, he, he's one of their two-way guys. Uh, what, Miller, I don't know his first name. It might be Malcolm Miller. He's another. He was another good player. He's another two-way dude for 905. Kennedy Meeks, who played at UNC, was there. Marcus Page, who was uh, another UNC guard plays for Greensboro. Cat Barber plays for Greensboro, who was an NC State guard. Uh, Lorenzo, Tyler, Lorenzo Brown, who I mentioned, was an NC State guard. So a lot of a lot of players that played in uh, the Carolina area, like the Greensboro, Chapel Hill, Durham, Raleigh, like that entire area were there. So the the fans were great at the game I went to. It was it was, uh, it was pretty electric, and it was a close game, so that helped. But I think the G League in general – it's just these teams have to get their own kind of venues and their own, I don't know, like a venue, I guess venue is the best word. Their own their organization to play to in and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they need to like attack it like they were their own team almost because like some of it, like you said, doing small promotions for any type of like minor league or G League type of stuff is going to help. Having other kind of things that gimmicky stuff at the arena is going to help build up the fan base. But I think with the NBA growing so big, the G League's definitely going to see some revenue come from that because people are just going to be more interested in the the next guys that can come up because we're seeing a lot more G League guys have success in the league. So shout out to my guy Spencer Dinwiddie who was killing it and he was a G League alum. So I think the fact. tough part for the G League though is I, I'll I won't name the team's name, but I know this team they'll they'll be getting their own venue and all that kind of stuff soon. But when I went to one of their games, they play in a college arena. And so with that, they have to schedule around, like they have to oh. work with the scheduling of the college games. So unfortunately, they don't have any home games on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday because those are all taken for the men's team or the women's team in college. So they play on weeknights, and that obviously hurts. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, not, it's more of a family atmosphere. That's what pro sports is. It's not that crazy college, Cameron crazies, drunk college student kind of atmosphere. But – it still hurts because you can't always get kids out to watch a G League game on a school night. 
maybe if it's an NBA game, a G League yeah. game on a school night, like it's that's a that's a hard sell to parents. Exactly. So I think once the G League becomes more of like their own thing, where all these teams have their own facility, um, don't have to share with other with other colleges or just other other people like a public setting. I think it would be. I think it's going to grow, and then you also have to kind of compete with college. Well, I don't think you'll necessarily be able to complete one, a compete a hundred percent because col- I mean, some of the college facilities at these top D one schools are better than pro facilities just because they have boosters, old old white dudes that have a crazy amount of money that just pour into the athletic departments, um, and pro teams will never really have that. Like business money is a lot more than athlete money. Like let's not let's not get that twisted. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so it'll be something it really cool. To keep has a lot to do, a lot, a lot of room for improvement. But it's it's great to where it where it was last. I don't know five years ago to where it is now. Huge strides. Exactly, and I mean, sure, we're gonna see some guys get some ten day contracts coming up soon. So listen to some of the names of Parth drop. We'll definitely have them on the outlet again. As always, Parth, thank you for taking the time to hop on. Corey, thank you, and thank you to all the listeners. You can catch the NBA outlet on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, and OTGBasketball.com.